Hello, Emmanuel Presbyterian Church. Uh, Pastor David here, uh, continuing in John's Gospel all the way up to Easter. This week we're in John chapter 7. I admit, like last week, uh, this is a long text. We're going to read almost the entire chapter. It's confusing. There's multiple layers of meaning. We're not going to go over every word and be able to analyze it all, but we want to analyze kind of the main meat that comes out of the text. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and flip over to John chapter 7. Uh, And we are going to be introduced to Jesus and his brothers. John 7, verse 1. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the, the religious leaders or those opposed to him were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. So his brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples may also see the works that you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. You can see the brothers sort of saying like, come on, man, like show everybody what we've seen. But interestingly enough, check out this next verse. For not even his brothers believed in him. And I think there's a little bit of indictment there from John, right? The writer, he's sort of saying like, they don't quite get it. Like they don't believe in him the way they should be believing in him. They just want him to continue to sort of make his presence known and gain a larger following. Verse six, Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come. Similar language that he used with his mother, right? But your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me. Because I testify about it and its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I'm not going up to the feast, for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, Jesus also went up, not publicly, but in private. Those who were looking to persecute Jesus were looking for him at the feast and saying, Where is he? And there was much muttering about him among the people. While some said, he's a good man. Others said, no, he's leading the people astray. And that's really, that's, that's right out of Deuteronomy 13. Like this is a false prophet trying to lead people's, uh, God's people astray. Verse 13, yet for fear of those who are opposed to him, no one spoke openly of him. Okay, so first thing we want, we want to start processing is what is the Feast of Booths or what's the Feast of Tabernacles, depending on your translation? Uh, many Jewish communities today still celebrate the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, they keep this festival around the world. It's a reminder, like so many other Jewish traditions, of their wandering in the wilderness, of God's prov- provision of being taken away from Egypt, but then this wilderness experience where for 40 years they set up booths, they set up tents, they set up tabernacles. They were a people that tabernacled with their God. And so they remember this and they, they celebrate it. And this is one of several pilgrimage feasts where you would actually make the trek to Jerusalem. So, so scholars think there's probably tens of thousands of people going towards Jerusalem for this massive celebration that was more than just, hey, let's all build a tent. It was also a, a, an agricultural feast where they celebrated uh, two crops in particular, um, grapes and olives. And so it was a huge celebration and there were processions and there were evenings where they would light lamps and it actually went eight days long. And interestingly enough, especially for this passage, it ends on a Sabbath, um, even like an artificial Sabbath. But uh, it, it ends also with this massive procession of priests um, in the temple Uh, And we're going to talk about that. But the priests would carry citrus fruit and palm branches. And then there was one culminating act they would do, which we'll get to towards the end. And so Jesus kind of sneaks away um, out of sight, out of mind, while his brothers go up to this feast. And uh, he tells his brothers, my time has not yet come. They want to show. They want more signs. I I love N.T. Wright's phrase. He's got this one just great little pithy phrase where he says, Um, Jesus's plan, the plan that he's kind of hatched in his mind, his mission, has a Passover shape to it, not a tabernacle shape to it. Passover would would have been one of those other pilgrimages that you make to Jerusalem. And N.T. Wright is saying, Jesus isn't this celebratory, um, huge feast banquet. Uh, That's not his mission, uh, this tabernacling. It's a Passover. 
right? It's about sacrifice. It's about the giving of himself to his people. Um, it's about death and then life, not this huge massive feast of sacrifice with uh, 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 rather with food and with celebration and, and water and wine. So let's continue. So Jesus is there but, and the people are looking for him. They kind of want to know what he's up to. Verse 14, about, and, and also by the way, there's, there's fear. Um, it's very known now that there's a force out to get Jesus. And so people don't really want to talk to about him or admit that, that, that they might know where he is because there's, He's out. People are out after him. Verse 14, about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. So for somebody who didn't really want to be there, now all of a sudden he's doing some public ministry. Ay, ay, ay. The, um, uh, the Jews therefore marveled, saying, how is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? How does this guy know what he's talking about, teaching at the temple, when he's never studied? He's never been under a rabbi. So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. Jesus is saying, You'll know if this is about me, if this is about my glory, or if this is about God's glory, you should be able to tell that. If you're attuned with God's will, you should be able to tell if I'm doing this for my glory or if I'm doing this to promote God's authority, God's power, God's will. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. But the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true. And in him there, in, in, in him there is no falsehood. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Okay. That's a bomb. Moses has given you the law, yet none of you keep the law. Why do you seek to kill me? Jesus says. The crowd answered him, You have a demon! Who is seeking to kill you? Okay, they're either playing dumb or they earnestly don't want Jesus to die because maybe they think he, he is somebody he's, who, he, who, who he claims to be. Jesus answered them, I did one work and you all marvel at it. Moses, and he's talking about when he healed the man on the Sabbath, the man at the pool. That's the one work that people just can't let go of, right? I gave you one work and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it's from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision, so, so oh, if on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision, what Jesus is saying is like, look, on the eighth day, if your young son on eighth day, on the eighth day, if if, if it's a Sabbath, you're gonna you're gonna give uh, you're you're gonna do the circumcision in order to fulfill Moses's law, God's law. You're gonna be obedient, even though you're not supposed to be working on the Sabbath. So just heads up, you do that. Is what Jesus is saying. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a whole man's body well? I want to know how long the pause was. Did the people just go, uh, uh, oh. Or, oh, that's different. We are commanded to circumcise on the eighth day. There's a, well, you're not commanded to heal a whole body on the eighth day, right? Jesus says, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. These Judeans are attempting to assess Jesus' words. How is this man full of so much learning without an education? Like, they're really kind of wrestling with the goodness he's saying, the truth he's saying, the way he's opening up the scriptures for them. They're trying to assess his words. N.T. Wright says this, in their weighing up of Jesus, in their assessment of Jesus, the Judeans, many have settled in their minds that there are certain things which they do not want God to be saying to them. They've already decided there's certain things that they do not want God to be saying to them. And if Jesus says those things, then they will rule him out of consideration right away. Notice how many times in this chapter alone, chapter 7, 
that people were ready and willing to kill Jesus. We've, we've only gone about halfway through the chapter and we're going to hear more. People are ready to kill him. They've already decided that, a he, that healing a man on the Sabbath which Jesus is now famous for, is punishable. Punishable even by death because this person has broken broken God's law and now is claiming to speak on behalf of God. Technically, technically speaking, their assessment of Jesus is that he's a false prophet leading the people away. Again, right out of Deuteronomy 13, this is a false prophet doing wonders and signs and leading God's people astray. Because God wouldn't heal a man on the Sabbath. They've already made their mind up. Our God would not do that. Verse 16, Jesus says, my teaching is not my own, it's God's. If you don't like it, maybe you've already closed your mind off to God's will. Jesus challenges them, right? He gets in their face. Look, he says, if you're willing to to work on the Sabbath... If it just so happens to be that the eighth day happens to be a Sabbath, you're willing to circumcise that baby for the sake of God's will. But if I heal a whole body on the Sabbath, you freak out. How can something that restores the entire dignity, physical, emotional, relational, uh, the whole entirety of a person, somebody who had no hope, who had no dignity, dignity, how could that be against God's will? You can hear Jesus sort of, Kind of being like, really? And so it continues. Some of the people, verse 25, some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said, is not this man whom they seek to kill? And here he is speaking openly and and they say nothing to him. I got to think that when Jesus made these points, they just froze. Even in his antagonism, in his truth-telling, in his blatant in-your-faceness, there's some conviction where they go, I don't really have a good response to that. Here he is speaking openly and they say nothing to him, it says. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? But we know where this man comes from and, and when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. So Jesus proclaimed, as he taught in the temple. You know me, and you know where I come from, but I have not come from my own, of my own accord. He who sent me is true, and him who you do not know. I know him, for I come from him, and he sent me. So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. Yet many of the people believed in him. They said, When the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? Again, we see all this um, uh, questioning, um, this misrecognition. There's there's even an accusation of maybe the authorities are in the know and they're just not telling us. Like, maybe they've actually already made up their mind that this guy is, in fact, the Messiah, So there's like conspiracy theories even uh, circulating around Jesus. Who is this guy? Maybe the powers that be know it and they just aren't telling us yet. Or when the Messiah comes, is is the Messiah going to be even more powerful than Jesus? Like even smarter than this guy and doing more miracles than this guy? This theme of misrecognition persists throughout this gospel. His own brothers, the disciples, the crowds, the leaders... The Judeans, the Galileans, Nicodemus, his own mother, you know, over and over and over again, there's sort of misrecognition of who Jesus is. And if I'm really honest with you, Emmanuel, Jesus isn't really helping the situation. He speaks in riddles with double meaning about a future, um, about future things that they cannot even yet begin to fathom. And And part of me goes like, what gives Jesus? You're like setting these people up for failure. And so the story goes on. The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him, and the chief priests and Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. And Jesus said, 
I will be with you a little longer, and then I'm going to him who sent me. You will seek me, and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go on the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does he mean by saying, You will seek me, and you will not find me? And where I am, you cannot come. Again, this misrecognition, this, this, these riddles that they don't understand. And then we get to the, the meat of the text. Verse 37, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out. If anyone thirsts, let them come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of their heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So John gives us a little insider uh, language there to tell us what Jesus is actually talking about. And so this term, living water, that Jesus says, in the ancient world, any source of running water was also called living water. It's why in chapter 4, the woman at the well says, where is this living water? I want it. She's, she actually means like, where's this fresher water source? A water source that's running, that's moving, that offers light. I mean, think about life, rather. Think about how important water is, especially in the ancient world, especially in the Middle East, in this desert region. Uh, the Qumran community that lived um, near the Dead Sea, they would actually carve out massive troughs out of the rocks so that when you would get that rare or that random rainstorm, the water would cascade down the trough like running water, like living water, and it would be guided. It would be directed into these huge cisterns that they could then gather the water. The ancient water was so, the ancient world was so dependent on water sources, on this living water. So what's Jesus saying to them, right? If anyone thirsts, let them come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, out of their heart will flow rivers of living water. What is Jesus talking about? What scripture is Jesus referencing the first is most likely Isaiah 55.1, which is the most evangelistic. It's the most invitational piece of Old Testament uh, scripture. I want to read it to you right here. Isaiah 55 verses 1 and on, and the whole passage is good. But come, everyone who thirsts, come to the water. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and, and labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me here that your soul may live. An invitation to something better, something satisfying. In the ancient world, the heart was actually thought to be the belly. And what, what it meant was the deepest part of your being, your core, the place where you feel your, your deepest desires, your longings, everything. And Jesus says, if you come to me, all of that will be satisfied bubbling up. Or another passage that Jesus may be refer referencing is Ezekiel 47, which is also uh, referenced again in Revelation 22. But it tells of, of this vision of a, of a river that flows from underneath the temple. As the temple is renewed and restored, this vision has this beautiful river that gets deeper and deeper as it flows out from the threshold. Again, this is from Ezekiel 47, Revelation 22. And as it gets deeper and deeper and deeper, it's no longer a river you can even cross. In fact, this river turns into a purifying living stream that goes into the Dead Sea and it takes its saltiness away. And all of a sudden, fruit trees come up from the, the, the beaches and, and fish come back into the water and it's a place where we can gather and be renewed and restored and oh, man it's this beautiful image so what's the invitation here why say that out loud as as these priests are standing around pouring water and wine all over the altar and jesus says in this loud voice he cries out come to me 
While the priests pour out the water and the wine in celebration of this, the future that God's going to inaugurate, right? They're celebrating the Messiah, this, this prediction, this future king who's going to come. They can't wait for it. Jesus being the very future that they're celebrating is right there. And he says, come to me. Standing publicly, inviting all, every last one of us who wants to have living water, the water of life bubbling up within us, flowing out to the world. On top of that, John tells us there's a spirit, God's refreshing personal presence available to all of us. Jesus says, you're celebrating in a future you long for, and it's right here. I'm right here. And so we close this chapter. Verse 40. When they heard these words, some of the people said, this really is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So there was a division among the people over him. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, sorry, the officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, why did you not bring him? The officers answered, no one ever spoke like this man before. Could you imagine that being tasked to go arrest Jesus? And as you listen to me go, I can't arrest this guy. I've never heard anyone speak like this before. The, off, uh, the Pharisees answered them, have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, who we met previously, you'll recall, came to Jesus in the night and got confused about being birthed again out of the womb. Nicodemus, who had gone to him before and who was one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? Does our law do that? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. After a failed arrest, which is sort of funny, we get yet another confusing dialogue that actually has some indicting comedy and maybe some of the best wordplay in all of scripture. After this failed arrest, we get more questions, more assertions. Jesus has already called those who oppose him out, right? He's called him out for not following the law correctly. Like, hey, so you're willing to circumcise somebody on the eighth day if it's a Sabbath, but you're, you're ticked off if I heal a whole person's body? Like, you, I don't think you really understand the law, you can hear Jesus say. He's confessed that his teachings are not his own, but belong to God. And then we see this two-part indictment, again, with comical proportions. First, Nicodemus calls out the Pharisees and says, hey, uh, so we're all Pharisees here. Um, isn't it law to hear somebody out? before we make a judgment. Like, don't you think maybe we should follow that law? That's sort of how we've handled everything in the past. That's, that's sort of our code. That's what we do. The Pharisees aren't even following their own laws in terms of like criminal prosecution. It's just, at this point, it's so emotional. It's so much anger. There's such a threat to their, their image of God that they're willing to throw out the law in order to indict Jesus. It's kind of funny. The people who are so set on following the law throw it out in this case. Second, there's a, a repeated assertion that no prophet can come from Galilee. This is yet another poke at how wrong they are, how misguided they are. There are at least two prophets from the Old Testament that come from Galilee, Jonah and Hosea. The word they use here is rise. Like, no, no prophet can rise from Galilee, right? No prophet rises from Galilee. This is a great play on words. We know that Jonah was raised from the dead, right? He didn't actually die, but after three days in the belly of the fish, he's raised. No prophet can, can raise from Galilee. Jonah did. 
and Hosea. In Hosea's, um, it talks about how God will, will rise up on the third day. And then Jesus is actually raised upon the cross and then raised to life on the third day as well. So what do we do with this passage? Two things. First is simple. Know that Jesus is going to accomplish his mission and his will, no matter what. Like there's nothing you or I can do to stop it. And that, that brings me great joy and hope. Nothing, nothing can thwart Jesus's will. Here's the second thing. This is more reflective for us. Where have you and I already made up our mind on what is godly action and what is not godly action for God to participate in? I'm going to say that again. What have you and I already made up our mind on? On like what God is and isn't allowed to do or going to do. The religious leaders just cannot let go of the fact that Jesus healed on the Sabbath. And so they plot to kill him. What parameters have you and I placed on God's behavior that could potentially blind us to God's very presence in our midst? What could God do that would make you so upset and say, God can't do that? Especially if it's something that restores somebody's dignity, humanity, physical health. We can either be a people that embrace God and take him up on his offer to have a spirit bubbling up within us, living water, life-giving water. Or we can work, we can toil, we can labor against him, and he will still prevail. Siblings at Emmanuel, let's choose Christ every single Amen.